world of YouTube, Evan Minton here, bringing you a Christian apologetics video. You may have heard the phrase that science disproves the existence of God, that science does away the need for an appeal to a creator. If This thought permeates our secularized culture, and many people believe it, especially those in the atheist camp. Well, science cannot prove or disprove the existence of God. So anyone who says that science can disprove the existence of God are not making a true claim. They are spreading misinformation. Now that said, while science cannot speak to the question of whether or not God exists, philosophy can. And as William Lane Craig, the Christian philosopher and apologist who runs reasonablefaith.org, likes to say, Science can support, science can provide evidence in support of a philosophical argument with theistic conclusions. Let me say that again. As Craig says, science can provide evidence in support of a philosophical argument for God's existence. So even though science on its own cannot say whether or not God exists, it can provide support, evidence, in premises that lead to the theistic conclusions. And in this video, we're going to look at what Christian philosopher William Lane Craig has popularized in his writings, the Kalam Cosmological Argument, originally formulated by the Muslim philosopher Al-Ghazali in about 1000 AD. So fire up those neurons, because we're about to use the brains that God gave us. Prior to the 19th century, scientists and philosophers have largely thought that the universe always existed, that it never had a beginning. It was, as Bertrand Russell put it, just a brute fact about reality. However, 1,000 years ago, the Muslim philosopher Al-Ghazali provided a philosophical argument for the universe's beginning and for the universe's beginning pointing to the existence of God as the best explanation of that beginning. Al-Ghazali used philosophical arguments for the universe's beginning since the science of his day was not inconsistent with an eternal universe. And later in this video, I will get into those philosophical arguments. But in the 19th century, scientific evidence started mounting for the origin of the universe, and this breathed new life into the Kalam cosmological argument. Dr. William Lane Craig has popularized the argument in his dissertation and in many of his other writings, and it is currently one of the most popular arguments for the existence of God today. The premises of the argument are as follows. 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two. The universe began to exist. 3. Therefore, the universe has a cause. This is a logically valid syllogism. The conclusion follows from the premises by the rule of inference known as modus ponens. Therefore, whether the conclusion is true will come down to whether the premises are true. So are these premises true or are they false? Well, let's look at them. Premise 1. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. This premise states that if something comes into being, there must have been something that existed prior to it that brought it into existence. There are three reasons to think that this premise is true. Reason 1. Something cannot come from nothing. To deny this premise is to say that something can just pop into being, uncaused, out of nothing. Surely this is absurd. Nothingness has no properties. Nothingness is not a thing. Nothingness is no thing. As Aristotle humorously put it, quote, nothing is what rocks dream about, end quote. Since nothingness has no properties whatsoever, it therefore does not have any causal properties either. Since it has no causal properties, it is, therefore, unable to bring anything into being. I am going to be candid here. Anyone who thinks that things can come into being from nothing is a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Nothing could be more absurd than the idea that something could pop into being out of nothing with no cause whatsoever. Reason 2. 
if things can come into being from nothing, we ought to observe it happening more often. If it were truly possible for something to come into being from nothing, why don't we see it happening more often? Why don't we hear news reports of people getting mauled to death by tigers and bears that popped into being out of nothing while going for their morning jogs? How come we've never heard of an automobile accident that was caused by a house materializing right in the middle of the freeway causing drivers to crash into it? Why is it that a gorilla has never poofed into existence in the middle of my room while I was blogging or podcasting or even making this YouTube video? The best explanation for why no one has ever seen these things is because they don't happen. And why don't they happen? Well, maybe because they can't happen. As Dr. William Lane Craig put it in his book On Guard, quote, What makes nothingness so discriminatory? There can't be anything about nothingness that favors universes, for nothingness doesn't have any properties. Nor can anything constrain nothingness, for there isn't anything to be constrained." End quote. Reason 3. We have an overwhelming number of things coming into being via a cause, and no examples of things coming into being uncaused. In our experience, whenever we see things coming into being, we see the cause of it. If I witness a sandwich being made, I always see a person putting it together. I've never seen a sandwich just poof itself right in front of me, right into being out of nothing. Whenever I see a sandwich coming into being, it always has a maker, a cause for its being. A maker of a sandwich always has people with plates, slices of bread, and condiments and other ingredients that they're taking and they're putting it together to make a sandwich in the kitchen. But I've never seen a sandwich just poof into existence in front of me. When we see houses and buildings coming into being, we see construction workers following carefully devised blueprints to put everything into place. We never see houses and materials just materialize out of nowhere. Whenever someone witnesses something coming into being, whether it's a car, an animal, a person, a computer, or whatever, we witness a cause bringing it into being. In every case of a thing coming into existence, we see a cause. We never see things popping into existence without a cause. For these three reasons, I think the first premise is true. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. But what about the second premise? The second premise says that the universe began to exist. Is this premise true or is it false? Let's look at the evidence. Premise 2, the universe began to exist. This premise has four lines of evidence in its favor. Two of them are scientific arguments, and the other two are philosophical arguments. Those would be the philosophical arguments that Al-Ghazali gave that I alluded to near the beginning of this video. Let's look at the scientific evidence. Scientific confirmation 1, the Big Bang Theory. Albert Einstein, in the 1900s, presented his general theory of relativity. Einstein's equations predicted a universe that was in a constant state of either expansion or contraction. Einstein wasn't fond of the implications of his theory, so he added a fudge factor to his theory to avoid those implications. During the 1920s, the Russian mathematician Alexander Friedman and the Belgian astronomer George Lemaitre managed to independently formulate math models of the universe that predicted an expansion. After that, in 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble discovered that the light coming from distant galaxies appeared to be redder than they should have been. Now, what do I mean when I say that Edwin Hubble saw that the light from the distant galaxies appeared to be redder than they should have been? In physics, when light or other electromagnetic radiation from something has a wavelength that is stretched to the point that its light is in the red side of the light spectrum, that is when the Doppler effect occurs. That's an example of the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is a change in frequency or wavelength of either light or sound caused by the motion of the source itself with the observer of the source. Here's another example of the Doppler effect in action. 
Let's say you're standing on the side of the road and you hear a race car approaching at a constant speed. As the car gets closer and closer to you, the pitch or tone of its engine sounds the same. But once the car passes you, the pitch of the engine changes and sounds lower than it did when it was approaching you. This is because as the race car approaches you, the sound waves are closer together, shorter wavelength. But as it moves farther away from you, the sound waves are farther apart, longer wavelength. Well, Hubble noticed this same sort of stretching in the light shining from the distant galaxies. Since the light waves were being stretched, Hubble concluded that the galaxies are moving away from us. And the reason they're moving away from us is that the universe is expanding. Now, for the first time, we finally had empirical evidence predicted by the theoretical work of Einstein, Friedman, and Lamatra. This had astounding implications. The fact that the universe is expanding meant that the universe had an absolute beginning. How so? Because if the universe is getting bigger and bigger as it gets older and older, then it must have been smaller in the past. Lee Strobel, in the film The Case for a Creator, gives this illustration to help us understand the implications of an expanding universe. Imagine the expansion of the universe is being played on a film projector. As the film runs forward, you see the universe expand as all of the matter and energy grows farther apart as time moves forward. The universe would get bigger and bigger as the film continues to run forward. But what would happen if you press the rewind button on the projector? In this case, you would see the universe get smaller and smaller and smaller until the universe becomes smaller than the period at the end of a sentence in a book. Rewind the expansion even farther back than that, and the universe reaches a point of infinite density, which is just another way to say that it, it shrunk down to nothing. This conclusion was drawn by what scientists call backward extrapolation. The universe began expanding from a point of infinite density about 14 billion years ago in a violent and rapid explosion-like expansion. This event that marked the beginning of the universe was dubbed by Fred Hoyle the Big Bang Theory. We have an abundance of scientific evidence for the Big Bang Theory. Aside from the theoretical and empirical evidence for the universe's expansion, there are other pieces of evidence as well. For example, the abundance of light elements in the universe supports the Big Bang Theory. Astrophysicists Deborah and Lauren Harzma explain that, quote, The third major piece of evidence is the amount of helium in the universe. The ordinary matter in the universe is about 75% hydrogen, 24% helium, and 1% other elements. Why this percentage and not some other ratio? Even in a universe billions of years old, the fusion in stars happens much too slowly to account for this much helium. Using the Big Bang model, astrophysicists calculate that the conditions of the universe about three minutes after the Big Bang were very similar to the interior of a star and just right for fusion reactions. The temperature and density of the hydrogen gas allowed it to fuse into helium and trace amounts of deuterium and lithium. The calculations of the Big Bang model even make precise predictions for the relative percentage of helium, deuterium, and lithium that would be produced. The model predicts that about 24% of the gas would be helium, in agreement with what astronomers observe." End quote. Additionally, scientists predicted that if the universe is expanding from a hot Big Bang beginning, then there should be residual radiation pervading the cosmos. This residual energy was confirmed by accident when Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were experimenting with the Holmdel antenna. Everywhere they turned the antenna, they picked up static. Initially, they thought it was bird droppings that was causing the statics, you know, sort of messing with the equipment. So they cleaned up their equipment, they removed all the bird droppings, but they found that they were still picking up the static. It turned out that the static was the cosmic microwave background radiation that scientists predicted would exist if the Big Bang Theory were true. Penzias and Wilson won the Nobel Prize for this discovery in the 1960s or 1970s. 14 billion years ago, matter, energy, space, and time 
came into being. In addition to the evidence for the Big Bang Theory, we have a second scientific confirmation for the beginning of the universe. According to the second law of thermodynamics, processes taking place in a closed system always tend toward a state of equilibrium, and it also transfers heat from hot bodies to cold bodies. This law is the reason that my ceramic heater, over there in the corner, uh, it keeps my bedroom, the entire bedroom, warm at night. It doesn't just keep a small corner of the room warm at night. The reason why it doesn't keep a small corner of the room is because second law of thermodynamics. The second law causes the heat to spread throughout the entire room. Heat travels from hot bodies to cold bodies. And this is why I sometimes give people a little bit of a hard time when they say, close the door, you're letting the cold in. I'm like, dude, do you even science? The second law of thermodynamics causes heat to travel from hot bodies to cold bodies, not the other way around. When you leave the door open in the winter, the heat escapes. The cold doesn't get in. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is relevant to the Kalam argument because of what entails when the law is applied to the universe as a whole. The whole universe, according to the first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of energy, uh, it, it's a gigantic, closed system. No energy is being fed into it from the outside. The astrophysicist Kevin Pimblett writes about the implication the second law will have in an article on phys.org. That's P-H-Y-S dot O-R-G. His article is titled, The Fate of the Universe, Heat Death, Big Rip, or Cosmic Consciousness. This is what Kevin Pimblett wrote. Quote, as the universe carries on expanding, we will no longer be able to observe galaxies outside our local group 100 million years from now. Star formation will then cease in about 1 to 100 trillion years as the supply of gas needed will be exhausted. While there will be some stars around, these will run out of fuel in some 120 trillion years. All that is left at that point is stellar remnants, black holes, neutron stars. 100 quintillion, 10 to the 20th power, years from now, most of these objects will be swallowed up by supermassive black holes at the heart of galaxies. In this way, the universe will get darker and quieter until there's not much going on. What happens next will depend on how fast the matter in the universe decays. It is thought that protons, which make up atoms along with neutrons and electrons, spontaneously decay into subatomic particles if you just wait long enough. The time for all ordinary matter to disappear has been calculated to be 10 to the 40th power years from now. Beyond this, only black holes will remain, and even they will evaporate away after some 10 to the 100th power years." End quote. Now, this raises a very interesting question. If the universe did not begin to exist, if it's always been here and it never had a beginning, then what that means is that the universe has always been chugging away its energy from eternity past. The universe has always been running down. But if, if the universe is eternally old and it's always been running out of energy, and scientists predict that eventually it will run out of energy, then it should be out of energy by now. In fact, it should have run out of energy an infinite amount of time ago, an eternity ago. And yet it hasn't. We still have energy left. That's how this computer is running. That's how I'm able to record this YouTube video. That's why the sun is still burning. There's still energy left in the universe. How is this to be explained? What explanation for this exists other than the fact that the universe hasn't always been here? It began to exist. There was a time when the universe was, so to speak, wound up and had all of its energy. Here's an analogy that I got from Frank Turek and Norman Geisler's book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. In their chapter on the cosmological argument, they give this analogy. They say, imagine you were walking through the forest and you found a flashlight on the ground. The flashlight is still shining light. What would you conclude from that? 
Well, knowing that the batteries only had a finite amount of energy, you would conclude that the flashlight hadn't always been shining light from eternity past. If it had been shining light from eternity past, then the flashlight would have stopped shining long before you found it. That it still has some battery life left to it shows that it was turned on a finite amount of time ago. We therefore have very powerful scientific evidence that the universe began to exist. Thus, premise two is confirmed. The universe began to exist. What's more, this evidence isn't something you'll only read about in creation science journals and articles. This is mainstream stuff. This is stuff that atheists and agnostics uh, in the scientific community are saying. People like Stephen Hawking, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Roger Penrose. This is not just something you'll hear Ken Ham or Jason Lyle talk about. This is mainstream scientific evidence. In affirming that the universe began to exist, I am standing with the scientific consensus. At, speaking of Stephen Hawking, he wrote this, quote, Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, this brings us to the philosophical arguments for the universe's beginning. And I think that these are the more powerful ones, because as I said in the blog post I wrote called Going for the Philosophical Jugular, no attempt to escape the universe's beginning has ever been able to escape the force of these arguments. Now the first is best done by means of an illustration, and I really like this illustration that William Lane Craig, William Lane Craig gives in his writings and his books and presentations on the Kalam argument. And here's a citation from the transcript of his Defenders class. Craig writes that one of the arguments is that an actually infinite number of things cannot exist. And he gives this argument by means of a three-step syllogism. One, an actually infinite number of things cannot exist. Two, a beginningless series of past events, or an eternal universe, involves an actually infinite number of things. Three, therefore, a beginningless series of past events cannot exist. This is a logically valid syllogism, and we just have to... Uh, premise two is pretty obvious. I mean, if the universe is eternally old, then obviously you've got a beginningless series, of uh, an infinite number of past events. So whether or not this argument for the beginning of the universe is sound will really boil down to whether premise one is true. So let's look at it. And, but first, let me define what I mean by infinite. There are, when we speak about an actually infinite number of things, there are two types of infinite. There's a potential infinite and an actual infinite. A potential infinite is an ever an ever increasing series of things, an ever increasing number of things that approaches infinity as a limit, but it never gets there. So for example, as a Christian, I believe I have eternal life and I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. Well, no matter how long I'm in heaven, I'm never going to have an infinitieth birthday. I'm never going to spend an infinitieth second or in, an infinitieth day or an infinitieth minute in heaven. I will never get there. That's a potential infinite. Now, an actual infinite is an actually infinite number of things is a number of things that is larger than any natural number. So any natural number you can think of. One, two, three, five hundred, seven trillion, nine hundred trillion, any number you can think of, actual infinity is always going to be larger than that. Now, this argument says it's not arguing that a potentially infinite number of things cannot exist, it's arguing that an actually infinite number of things cannot exist. And the illustration that Craig gives to support this point uh, he actually got from a, a mathematician called Hilbert's Hotel. This is what Craig writes. 
Hil- this is called Hil- quote this is called Hilbert's Hotel after the great German mathematician David Hilbert. Hilbert first invites us to imagine a hotel with a finite number of rooms. Let's say let's suppose that all of the rooms are full and suppose that a new guest shows up at the desk asking for a room. Sorry, the manager says, all of the rooms are full and the new guest has to be turned away. But Hilbert says, now Let's suppose instead we have an infinite hotel with an infinite number of rooms. Let's suppose again that all of the rooms are full. This is critical to understand. There is not a single vacant room in the entire infinite hotel. Every room is occupied by some guest. Now let's suppose that a new guest shows up at the desk asking for a room. Of course, of course, says the manager and he proceeds to ship the guest who was in room 1 into room 2, the guest who was in room 2 into room 3, the guest who was in room 3 into room 4, and so on and so forth out to infinity. As a result of these transpositions, room 1 now becomes vacant and the new guest gratefully checks in. And yet, before he arrived, all of the rooms were full. Even stranger, according to the mathematicians, there are no more people in the hotel than there were before the new guest checked in. But how can this be? We just saw the manager give him his keys and walk down the hall. How could there not be one more person in the hotel than before? But Hilbert's hotel becomes even stranger. Now let's suppose, Hilbert says, that an infinite number of new guests arrive at the desk asking to check in. And remember, all of the rooms are full. Every room is occupied. No problem. No problem, says the manager. And he moves the guest who was in room 1 into room 2. The guest who was in room 2 into room 4. The guest who was in room 3 into room 6. Moving every former guest into the room number twice his own. Since any number multiplied by 2 gets you an even number, all of the odd-numbered rooms become vacant, and the infinity of new guests gratefully check in. Yet before they arrived, all the rooms were full. Again, according to the mathematicians, there are no more people in the hotel than before they checked in, even though there were just as many new guests as there were old guests. In fact, the proprietor could do this an infinite number of times, and there would always be room for more guests, and there would never be any more people in the hotel than before. Now, Dr. Craig goes on to explain, and I'm not going to quote anymore because I don't want to go over the fair use limit, but he goes on to explain that if we apply subtraction to this hotel, What happens? Well, let's suppose that we take all of the guests out of the odd-numbered rooms. Only the guests out of the odd-numbered rooms. In that case, an infinite number of people have left the hotel, and yet there's still an infinite number of people in the hotel. There are an infinite number of people in all of the even-numbered rooms. You have an infinite number of odd-numbered rooms, an infinite number of even-numbered rooms. You take all of the people out of the odd-numbered rooms, you have all all of the even-numbered rooms left. Infinity minus infinity is infinity? But then Craig says, well, what happens if we... What happens if we... Take only the guests out of the hotel after the the num- the room number three room number three all of the guests n- numbered four and greater then you have three people left in the hotel and in this case infinity minus infinity is three well what happens if you take all of the people out of the hotel well then infinity minus infinity is zero you see what happened here we subtracted an identical quantity from an identical quantity every single time infinity minus infinity infinity minus infinity infinity minus infinity and yet we got different results Craig asks can such a hotel really exist in reality and he humorously recalls an instance in which his student said that if Hilbert's hotel could actually exist it would have to have a sign outside that says no vacancy, guests welcome. 
this illustrations like this and there are others in my book the case for the one true god i give an illustration involving cds because i'm a music lover um but pieces like this show that infinity if an actually infinite number of things could exist absurdities would result this shows that infinity is simply an idea in our minds it is not something that exists in reality once you understand the concept of infinity, you can see, you can pick up stories for yourself, and you can see the, the paradoxes and absurdities that result from the existence of an actually infinite number of things. Now, let's look at the second argument against an actually infinite number of things. This is the argument against traversing an actual infinite. Even if an actually infinite number of things could exist, even if that were the case, nevertheless you could never form a collection of an infinite number of things by adding one after another. One, two, three, four, five, no matter how long you count, you will never count to infinity. Now, if the universe is eternally old, then this means that we have traversed through an infinite number of past events. What that means is that today, this moment, right now, that led to you watching this YouTube video, it never would have arrived. Because before this moment could arrive, before this, let's, before this day could arrive, yesterday had to arrive. Before yesterday could arrive, the day before that had to arrive. Before that day could arrive, the day before it would have to arrive. Before that day could arrive, the day before it would have to arrive. And before that day could arrive, the day before it would have to arrive, and so on and so on and so on. No day in the infinite number of past days could ever dawn because there would always be an infinite number of days that preceded each day in the infinite lineup. Not only could the present moment, not only could the present day not occur, but none of the days in the infinite past series could have occurred. Because every single day in the infinite series would each have an actually infinite number of days that would have to dawn prior to it coming about. Imagine a series of dominoes, and th these series of dominoes each represent moments in time. Let's say you've got a red domino at the front, and you've got uh, black and white dominoes going all the way back into infinity. Before the red domino could fall over, a domino before it would have to fall over. Before that domino could fall over, the domino before it could would have to fall over. Before that domino could fall over, the domino before it would have to fall over. Before that domino could fall over, well, I get, you see, I think you get the point. No domino could ever fall over. In fact, each domino in the set would have an infinite number of dominoes that would have to fall first. So none of the dominoes in the set could fall over. Now, prior to what my childhood hero, Buzz Lightyear, said, you cannot go to infinity and beyond. Mr. Lightyear doesn't, simply doesn't understand the nature of infinity. You cannot even traverse infinity, much less go beyond it. So this is a second philosophical argument for the beginning of the universe. The only way that the red domino in the set could fall is if there was a first domino and someone flicked the first domino over. The only way that today could arrive is if there was a first day, a first moment in time. And here's another thing to consider. What's going to happen tomorrow? Tomorrow we're going to add another day in the series of past days. Today will be yesterday, and there will be another day in the series of past days. But wait a minute, does that mean that we've added to infinity? That's impossible. Infinity is the largest number there is. You cannot add to it. There is no number larger than actual infinity. The very fact that we're going to have another day tomorrow 
proves that the universe is not past eternal. Now, if you doubt that there's going to be another day added, then just wait, just wait 12 hours. You will see that I'm right. So we've got a lot of scientific arguments and a lot of philosophical arguments for the universe's be beginning. So we have seen good reasons to believe that both of the premises in the Kalam cosmological argument are true. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Now at this point in the argument, you may be wondering, how does this get us to God? After all, the Kalam cosmological argument syllogism proper doesn't even have God in the premise. It just says the universe has a cause. Well, at this point in the argument, it's important that we do a conceptual analysis of the conclusion, rather than just stopping at the conclusion, which, I mean, that would, the universe has a cause, that's theologically neutral. We have to ask ourselves, what type of properties would a cause of the universe have? What types of properties would properly go to make it? Well, the cause of the universe must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, unimaginably powerful, supernatural, uncaused, and personal. It must be spaceless because space came into being and did not exist until this cause brought it into existence. The cause cannot be a spatial being because there was no space prior to the cause bringing it into existence. You cannot be inside of something if you are that something's cause. You cannot be inside of something if that something did not exist until you brought it into existence. The builder of a house, for example, cannot be inside of the house prior to building it, since the house didn't exist until he brought it into existence. The cause must be timeless because time did not exist until the Big Bang. The cause cannot be inside of time because the cause created time. It must be a timeless being. It must be an immaterial entity because this is, a, uh, this is an entailment of its non-spatiality. How so? Because material objects cannot exist unless space exists because material objects have mass and therefore they occupy spatial dimensions. If there is no space, matter cannot exist. This means that because the cause is non-spatial, it is therefore non-material. It must be unimaginably powerful because it was able to create all matter, energy, space, and time out of nothing. It must be supernatural because nature and the universe are synonyms. Nature did not begin to exist until the Big Bang. Therefore, a natural cause, a cause coming by definition from nature, cannot be responsible for the origin of nature. To say otherwise would be to spout incoherence. You would basically be saying nature caused nature to come into being. The cause must be uncaused as a result of it being timeless. The cause cannot have a beginning if it's timeless. To have a beginning to one's existence entails a before and after. There's a before one existed and a time after one came into existence. But a before and after of anything is impossible without time. Since the cause created time, the cause therefore cannot have, cannot have had a beginning. It's beginningless. It must be personal. There are three reasons for this, but in order to avoid making this video longer than it already is, I'm just going to give one. This, the one reason and the quickest one to articulate is that it's an entailment of the cause's immateriality. There are two types of things recognized by philosophers as being candidates for immaterial entities, either abstract objects like numbers or unembodied minds. But abstract objects are causally impotent. The, they can't cause anything. The number seven, for example, can't produce any effects. So since abstract objects are causally effete, the only other option is an unembodied mind, something like a spirit or a soul. So these are the positive reasons, the positive arguments given for why the cause of the universe 
must be a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, uncaused, personal, supernatural, personal being. Now, I don't know about you, but this sounds a lot like God.